Hello guys, Colin here, and I'm at Post Electric Studio today with... Uh, I'm Rod Jones, I'm producer here and uh, one of the owners uh, of the studio with Chris Paul, uh, also a guitarist in Idlewild. Yeah, it's uh, fantastic for you to have me here. Oh, Thank you very much. Welcome. How long have you had the studio here in Edinburgh? Um, we've been here a year. It was a studio before um, called Tape Studio. Obviously all the hard work in terms of building was done for us, mm -hmm. um, which is nice. But yeah, it's, it's been a steep learning curve. It's been a very interesting year. Yeah, um, you know, <laughs> you, you don't see daylight as much as you do when you're not. <laughs> when Certainly you're not. Um, but we've been much busier than we thought we would be in mm -hmm. the first year. Um, we've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of really nice uh, and interesting artists come through. I suppose they've written down all of the things that we'd done wrong and right. all the things that we'd uh, maybe cabled wrong in the first mm -hmm. month before we opened. Uh, and then sort of shot for a couple of weeks to recable it. So we're just back <laughs> out the other side of that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, getting started again. You've got a lot of equipment here. How much of this was bought for the studio and how much of it is an um, accumulation of things that you've gathered over the over your time uh, as a musician? Well, some of it we took over with the studio when we came in. Some of it was, uh, most of the most of the amps and guitars are all bought over the over the years from touring and, uh, and traveling around and seeing things in in the window uh, and you know, well, I better take that home with me and we brought in some mics and bits and pieces and we also took on a lot of the stuff that was here as well mm -hmm. so a lot of stuff was left in situ so we yeah. gradually gradually chipping away at paying all of that off <laughs> <laughs> excellent so let's take a look about the studio and uh, you can show me what equipment you have here great welcome post electric studio we're in the control room uh in the main studio this is where i spend the lion's share of my life at the moment. <laughs> um, this is our main event behind us, as you can see. It's a SSL Duality, which is a fairly modern analog console. Um, it's a hybrid of sorts. Every channel strip is an analog channel strip. It controls the door, however, as well, so it will sync in with whatever software you're using, whether it be Pro Tools, mm -hmm. Logic, or Cubase. As Bizarrely, some people still use. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, using Pro Tools here, using Pro Tools, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is the industry standard for recording. It, yeah. For a reason, it's very easy for editing, for uh, for quality for audio. I find it certainly the the only way to work for tracking audio and recording audio. Pro Tools works very much in the way that an inline console would, and that each channel's got uh, two signal paths, um, yeah. and in and then out. Um, uh, it's a very good way to train young engineers actually mm -hmm. getting an understanding of signal flow um, which is the one thing they never seem to really <laughs> learn these days so yeah um, it's uh, so other than that this the, you can assign these faders to be analog faders or flip them to be um, in digital mode so they're then controlling the faders and pro tools um, yeah you can write your automation during mix. Um, it also then your center section obviously you've got your uh, famous SSL Boss compressor, which is what glues everything together, makes things sound like a record, really, yeah. almost instantly. You know, even when you're uh, tracking uh, using a little bit of it, it, it starts to glue glue things together in a way mm. that it's difficult to do without. <laughs> it's a very, very versatile, clever, clever console. Um, sounds great. There's a few interesting things like secondary harmonic drive on every channel, so you can get a little right. bit of extra, uh, extra low end, a little bit of extra character out of out of your kick drum or your snare or bass guitar when you're mixing analog um it it's fully recallable very very quickly which makes obviously waiting around for a band to comment on a mix less of a chore yeah <laughs> <laughs> you can get on with the next one and then come back uh, it mm -hmm. makes recalls a lot easier than certainly when i was first learning uh you know and you and you were on a fully analog console I had some recall but mm -hmm. you know, uh, this is very very quick to be. I can you can recall pretty much every every switch and knob on this in 15 minutes. I'm monitoring in here the classic NS10. But I think it's probably one of the worst sounding speakers in history. Of music, <laughs> but I've become an industry standard. Everybody knows them. Very very precise and mid range, so you get very good for making sure you haven't made a mistake. The Dyn Audio the PM15. These are custom ones made by Monroe Acoustics for the studio. Mm -hmm. um, I can never remember the actual model number of the big Dyn Audios, they're what we call the Impressed Band speakers. Um, oh, right, okay. But uh, you know, they'll, they're full range, um, they'll go very, very loud, but mm -hmm. um, I never use them for mixing. We, When we took the place on, we looked at what every other studio 
in the area and in, in the UK what the sort of the industry standard was, I suppose, what yeah. people expected, but also what what we had and what we liked and what we thought might be useful to us. We didn't want to go too far. This is a, a very good working collection of analog outboard that I think makes makes our life easier mm -hmm. um, and is attractive enough for uh, for other producers coming in. Some of the classics, which I'm sure most people recognise, things like your 1176, your silver face, um, to the black face 1176s, uh, Amos Neve stereo compressor and limiter, which is Fantastic. It's my go-to stereo compressor for anything mm -hmm. like uh, for stereo micing piano or quite often use it on the room uh, right. mics for drums. It tends to warm and, pun and make things a little punchier. Um, I, I, I really like it. Not my go-to when I want to destroy something. Um, <laughs> yes. it, 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 it's, it can be quite subtle, which, I, which mm -hmm. I use it generally on signals I don't want to obliterate. Yep. The Chandler, um, the TG1, again, compressor limiter, also has a very nice harmonic distortion, which uh, actually nine times out of ten recently I've been using it on overheads and, and not actually using the compression, but just using the harmonic okay. distortion to get a little bit of crunch out of the snare, yeah. um, give a little bit of fizz. LA2A, fairly industry standard, mm -hmm. great compressor, uh, optical circuit, so you know no um, settings for attack and release, it's automatic, yeah. um, great on guitars. It's my go-to for taming uh, a little bit with uh, with guitars, I use it on acoustic quite a lot. Okay. Uh, push it. I'm a big fan of the over-compressed 70s um, acoustic guitar. That's right, got yeah. Still a nice approach. Um, so it gets a good workout whenever we're doing that. The Ridge Farm Boiler, which is a one of my one of my favourite pieces of gear we have. Um, an ultra compressor mm -hmm. really really smashes everything. <laughs> um, I use it predominantly for uh, drum parallel. Okay. So. Um, Actually, an idea that was given to me by uh, uh, a sort of mentor of mine who recorded a lot of our Idlewild records back in the day, Dave Erringer. Um, okay. He came in here to run a session, was using it contextually as he was tracking, so mm -hmm. running a lot of his parallels that he would use in the mix of so parallel compression on the drums during tracking so that okay. he could contextually think, OK, this is what it's going to sound like when I mix it. So this yeah. is the space I have, this is the this is the punch I have in the drums. Mm -hmm. It was a bit of a light bulb moment for me in terms of tracking. I tend to do a lot of that now, run a lot of my parallels, a lot of my a lot of my groups as I'm as I'm tracking in the way yeah. that I would group things together in the mix. Okay. Uh, gives you an idea of the space that you have. So uh, smashing kick and snare together through mm. that pretty much uh, sometimes the toms as well um, in w which case using it in stereo um, and then going through the transient designer um, mm -hmm. to back off some of the sustain get rid of any hi-hat <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and also push a little bit more attack in it gives you a very punchy snappy kick and snare the distressor one of the like, a real real workhorse Compressor, yeah. really vibey. We used it a lot on early Idlewild records, uh, on the drums and guitars actually. More often than not, when I when we first got one, and it's because it, because it sounds great when you really do drive it and you nuke things through it. it quite <laughs> often, using it on the fun mics on the drums, you know, whether right, that yeah. be a Ringo mic over the shoulder or whether it be a mic on the floor, or, mm -hmm. and really smashing it because it yes. does it distorts really nicely. It gives you a really it's the mic that you use and you think that sounds great and then when you get to the mix you probably use it for 20 seconds of one song on an album. The Joe Meek, again a stereo, another stereo compressor, um, optical circuit again, uh, it it's, has its own unique sound, that one. Uh, it's probably one of the less known uh, mm -hmm. compressors in our collection. I find it quite dark, it tends to right. darken things a little bit, I use mm -hmm. it um, predominantly when, when I want to tame piano maybe. Right. Um, uh, recently using it on uh, our corridor mics, which we usually put a stereo mic in the corridor when we're micing up drums, which we'll see later. DBX160, uh, probably the best um, kick and bass uh, compressor ever made. Um, fairly famously great great for gluing the kick drum and the bass together. Yeah. Really makes kick and snare sound much more attack very, very, very mm -hmm. quickly. LA3A. My biggest use of these at the moment, I tend to use them on vocal before I before I go to an 1176. Okay. Um, so I tend to use the, 11, the LA3 to just give, you know, take, tame it a little mm -hmm. bit, just take the 
take the edges off yes. um, before I then send it to 1176. The silver face, which I find out of the two, uh, will will bring the book all really yeah. up front. They do, I find, if you push them too hard, start to do a bit of a fizzy distortion thing. So I yeah. tend to tame it a little bit with the LA3A, then, then, push then into the 1176. If I'm multi-miking, uh, we'll quite often use them on you know one on each one on each mic um, to give it the same mm -hmm. same feel. Uh, yeah, this is a valve compression section. Obviously, you'll see one is missing <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. as with most studios, things break. There's usually a back rack here, which is a tube uh, limiter and uh, well, three tube limiters and a tube pre power supply has gone down. Um, reasons I shall not divulge. Underneath it the Federal 184 which is a, an old US military um, oh, right. compressor limiter, uh, it, it, more of a limiter really, it's, it, it smashes everything. Go this far and then it will. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're building a, an attenuator for it. Okay. Um, it, it, it it's obviously semi supposed to attenuate itself as you mm -hmm. as you turn it up but uh, it will boost the volume quite significantly so mm -hmm. in in the meantime i tend to run it through the zero ratio setting on the lem 76 just to turn yeah. it down retro stay level the the new sort of clone of the, the old gates stay level fairly well known tube compression i i'm not sure that i i've, I've never completely believed the meters on these things when it tells you it's been tw 10 or 20 db of compression time. yeah <laughs> it doesn't seem like it really is it really does thump i find with a lot of modern acoustic guitars that they tend to be quite middly and thin mm. um this will really really fatten them up in a nice way it'll really push the low the lower end quite like it on female vocals actually mm. when i when i don't want um to push them too hard with 1176 i find sometimes you get a little bit too much in the six to eight k of the the breathiness of a softer female singer. This yes. this will tame them a little bit. Tube Tech, um, fantastic EQ. Um, predominantly kick and snare. I'm using that on though. Yes. Just if I can't quite get enough, if you've got a softer player and you want a bit more, mm -hmm. a bit more thud or a bit more bite, um, it, it, it's it's a real go-to for that. The API 5500, just a great stereo EQ. I'm usually when I'm mixing, running that on my master bus, pushing the musical frequencies. Uh, yes. Them. <laughs> um, they're very musical EQ APIs. Like it, with SSL, with Neve, with API, there are always notches on their EQs that you'll find, or there's always a dot on the EQ, which isn't mm. a whole number. You'll notice 1.6 yes. on everything that is, you know, one of the magic frequencies um, for making vocals cut or guitars cut. Uh, mm. the, there are points on on the 5500 that I particularly like of the stereo EQ that just tend to open things out a little bit I tend to mix into it so that I, I just I just know that for me where I where I like to hear things popping is where, where they'll always be popping mm -hmm. it's maybe bad practice it's just the way I do things there. <laughs> <laughs> this rack uh, the API we're, is currently being uh, we're currently <laughs> building uh, eight uh, of the Cappy Pre's, mm -hmm. which are, are going in there, which are, I don't think you're allowed to say clones of what they're clones of. Um, <laughs> yes. I think for legal reasons, you're not yes, allowed stay, to. Stay it's about fairly it. obvious. Mm -hmm. um, they're uh, they're a great sort of project kit. You can build very very high end uh, A class Pre um, mm -hmm. uh, for very cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they sound great. Underneath that, the DAV Broadhursts four channel um, preamp. Lots of thud and punch, very good on kick and snare again. If yeah. if you want a little bit more thud and a little bit more warmth, they're a good opposition to the to the, the clean SSLs. They can be mm -hmm. sometimes if I'm looking for a bit more grunt in that way, I'll go to the DAVs, the Cytex. Um, again, they're a, a rackable sort of uh, version of the Neotech Pre's, which you get in con uh, such as Electric Audio, Albini Studio, running the Neotech. They're yeah. they're um, my colleague Chris actually bought this because he saw saw the near tech that Albini was using and Chris <laughs> was a big fan of his sound. Um, with those we just switch them in, switch this desk into line mode. Uh, each channel is switchable in that way. Um, and your input, bizarrely when we were cabling up this desk we were thinking where's the line input, we couldn't find the hole <laughs> for anywhere and it's all just one input. It's all completely different to any other console I've ever seen. <laughs> um, so you just in the central routing system you change the channel that you want to line input or channel input. All right. Um, very clever. Makes you curse quite a lot for the first couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> then we get to our sort of toy rack, I suppose yep. uh, you would call it, all of the expensive toys. Digital delay, TC2290, fantastic sending digital delay. Mm -hmm. uh, almost always 
got something going through that on a session. Um, use a lot of vocals, depending on the on the singer. But for a little bit of warmth and aggression, I tend to use a, a round, quite a slow slap, but in stereo behind the vocal. Right. Have a completely dry one up front. Okay. Because we have the the tools to do it, I tend to compress fairly hard on the way in mm -hmm. vocal. Still try and keep it as natural sounding as possible. So when I then come to mix, I'm usually running a parallel of that vocal, mm -hmm. um, parallel compression of that vocal, which I will slam, but leave the central, uh, the original vocal uncompressed in the okay. mix, just so that you have that movement. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, if you've done it right, without even any EQ on it, <laughs> you recorded <laughs> yes. it right. In the first place. <laughs> Try to get it right and then support it yes. behind the AMS, the DMX, which is the, uh, I suppose, one of the real forerunners of digital technology in Iraq. <laughs> um, uh, digital delay, extremely um, heavy fans in these things and oh, they just right. suck in dirt. <laughs> so you have to give them a good once over every now and again. Yes. The RMX, great uh, old school digital reverb, classically used in the 80s with the non-lin reverb all over Springsteen records and then can, oh, right. you know, that very, yes. very short non-linear reverb to fatten up your snare drum. The plate on it is great on snare as well. Mm. That's my go-to kind of drum reverb when we're going a little 80s, which is more often the case now with a lot of young bands coming and going, can you make the snare sound a bit more Phil Collins? Yeah, <laughs> I can understand. That's how you do it. <laughs> the Bricasti is uh, probably, uh, in my opinion, the best outboard reverb there is at the moment, the M7. It, just the world and above everything else I've tried. Um, everything, every single reverb in there every preset they give you sounds fantastic you know we uh the the plate is great um mm -hmm. the chamber reverbs are fantastic quite often honest i will choose the plate in the m7 over the real plate we have <laughs> really <laughs> um, wow not all the time yeah um there is a there is a a warmth to the the real plate which is fantastic mm -hmm. uh then we've just got a few fun toys you know the, uh, the pcm 42 i use uh Actually, more often than not, I'm using that just as a pre-delay for the, the, the real plate in the back. Right. Um, so going into that before we go to the... Um, but again, great slap. Um, sounds great on bass guitar. Mm -hmm. um, if you want a little bit of that 70s sort of short scale um, slap on the bass. Eventide H3000. Again, great sort of multi-voice harmonising processor. Basically modulating and pitch shifting. Um, can be great to give you that kind of co uh, can work as a great chorus, great uh, great for thickening things, sitting things back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tends to make everything sound a little 90s. Right. <laughs> yeah. Gives you that very kind of um, wide sort of modulated guitars. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can be f good on vocals as well. Um, I, I use that a lot on piano gives you a kind of a that weird kind of pink floydy kind of okay. piano vibe dimension c the the chorus dimension d even sorry uh, mm -hmm. dimension c is the bad pedal clone of it well not bad actually it's a good pedal clone of it four switch chorus 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 here more chorus here <laughs> um, nice and simple switching system. nice and simple it's just a great uh, just one of the great choruses of all time great on guitars great on uh, piano, I use it quite a lot on sub synthy stuff just to spread it a little wider yeah. as well, get out of the way of the bass if there's if, you know a lot of a lot of the uh, indie bands coming in and want that subby um, XX kind of mm -hmm. low end, um, but also have a bass guitar as well, but they want this on the keys as well, so trying yeah. to get it out of the way of the bass guitar. Culture Vulture, distortion, essentially saturation, great. For yeah. Adding a bit of crunch, a bit of, uh, bit of grit to uh, your guitar boss. Uh, you're on snare quite a lot to get that kind of processed, a bit almost programmy uh, snare sounds. Mm -hmm. Vocals great for if you you know you've got a need a bit of bit more aggression out of your singer, um, or you're going for that you know distorted vocal vibe. That's just fun. It's great. Yeah. It makes everything sound aggressive and and saturated and cool. That's one of those things you spend all of your all of your time trying to get the mix nice and clean and get everything <laughs> sitting nice and then you go right now let's put everything through the culture also. yeah so yeah this is the studer a80 one of the best sound and tape machines ever made really it has its own little uh, quirks mm -hmm. um, like anything else analog and old um <laughs> it's not the tape machine you want if you want to be able to drop in quickly right um, okay 
you really need a good second or two's gap before you can drop anybody in. Yes. It really does make you, you have to play it right. <laughs> <laughs> um, or just do it again. It's a different way of working, obviously, um, than, than tracking to a door, to Pro mm. Tools. Um, it's a different concentration level, both for the band and for the, uh, the engineer. It's a great way to work. You're, you're immersed much more in the in the sonics and mm -hmm. not looking at a screen, not looking to see if something's peaking, yeah. you're just listening. If something is is hitting a little hard in the tape machine, it will saturate, it will mm -hmm. distort a little bit, but you will hear it and it, does it sound good? Cool, it does. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter if the needle's all the way over, if it sounds good. We're all guilty sometimes of when when working in, in a door and you're tracking and you know that you've got an Apple Z or a Control Z or whatever it is and you can undo or you can mm -hmm. re-go over and you're not taking up precious space on tape that your focus can go from time to time when you're trying to take that is not the case you're really no. listening all the time and immersing and you're committing as well quite often the way i try to work and the way that we all try chris and and uh, and our engineers here that try to work is that we try to get it right in the first place yes I, i'm very much a believer in not being one of these people who say oh it's okay i'll fix it later mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i think that that's something that was drilled into me um, by people like Dave Erringer and Bob Weston and people we worked with over the years who worked on our records. It was all very much about committing to a sound at the time. Yes. Getting, getting the snare sound right at the time, getting the kick sound right at the time, not going, oh, I'll just stick some samples on it later. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's very easy to do that nowadays. Um, and, and it can be a working method that works for some. It's not what our ethos is here, though. Our ethos is about trying to get the way that you would work to tape, even when we're not working to tape. If we're presenting someone with a uh, with a session that we're not mixing, we're giving them something that we can say, look, here it is. This is how it should sound. Yeah. Um, not. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first time you work that way on tape, or I mean, we were tracking to tape before. We were tracking to Pro Tools in in Idleworld. Certainly, when we were, you know, Pro Tools. I think we first used on the third record. Um, and again, at that point, it was something you used. After we'd tracked the drums, we'd dump the tape into into Pro Tools and then wait for an hour for it to start up, and then watch right. it crash, and then wait for another hour for it to start up. This was, mm -hmm. you know, late 90s, and it was still a new thing, um, still running in OS 9 or something yeah. probably. So, you, you know, at that point, you were still very much in the tape frame of mind, getting into digital, uh, and and I suppose actually training myself in terms of engineering more in that world before I did in the analog world, even though I was used to recording in the analog world. Um, you do fall into those practices if you're not careful of, of not really focusing enough and not mm. listening enough and, and thinking, oh, I can fix it later. Yeah. And that's what, in the last few years, we've really focused on trying to go back the other way and, and, and approach it much more. And if you, if you present the the tape or the the door with with quality then it will gel together a lot yes. better at the back end <laughs> and you won't spend three weeks trying to mix one song it should be that most of the work is done for you yeah. by the time you get to the mix i'm sort of mixing as i go when mm -hmm. i'm tracking i'm not just throwing stuff down i'm doing a lot of the tweaking as i go yes. contextually which was as i say a very recent methodology change for me which mm -hmm. came from again watching someone else do that and thinking hang on that's a really good way to work you know and uh, and was a real game changer for me actually in the way that I work it, when you get to the mix you really are almost balancing you know and not fixing yes um, you know where everything sits you know that you've got that space and you tend to make less mistakes that way tracking you're not throwing I had a you know or oh, let's throw the kitchen sink at everything and you know we'll strip it out later and you quite often be throwing keyboard parts in on top of guitar parts that are all in the same register and they're mm -hmm. fighting for space in the mix. Yes. Now when you start to think of it in the contextual way as you're tracking, thinking okay well there's not going to be space in that register because we've got that covered with this wall of guitars. Let's even as simple as just put the keyboards up an octave, you know, whatever yeah. it is, you, you're thinking much more long game in mm -hmm. that. Uh, and it makes your life a lot easier. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty much our control room. So we move into the recording room? Yeah.